Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. We uh, by, put on by Catholic Textbook Project and our speaker being Philip Campbell. Um, we're glad you could be here, especially on this early hour. Uh, just to let you know that we are recording this, so this will be uh, sent out to everybody who registered for, our, for their webinar. It'll be sent out, um, so you'll have that probably either tomorrow or on Monday. We'll get it out to you. But again, I want to thank you for being here. I'm Matt Summers, the Vice President of Catholic Textbook Project, and um, we're able to be joined here by uh, Philip Campbell. As we begin, I, I just like to begin with a prayer, just to you know, get ourselves centered um, in during this holy Easter season. And again, happy Easter, everybody. The Lord has risen, and we're so grateful for that at this time of the year. But let us just take some time to quiet ourselves, reflect upon all the beauty, beauty that God has given us, uh, the blessings that he's blessed with us, especially our children, our students that we work with every day. So let us begin as we remember all those who have been affected by what's going on in Europe, over there in Russia and Ukraine. We pray for peace and we pray for all those, again, especially those who have been affected, whether they're affected out there or affected here in our own homeland of the United States. Let's begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, O oh Father, we come to you today. We give you thanks for all our teachers, teachers whether they're in the classrooms, in our schools, or in our homes. Thank you for the way in which you give themselves each day to all of us as we, we work with our students, serving, instructing that next generation of our beautiful land of this country. We thank you for them. We thank them again. We thank you for them. Please fill their hearts with courage by your Holy Spirit. Fill them with your strength so they may rise to every challenge, not to grow weary. Fill them with your wisdom so that they may be able to make good judgment when guiding and helping others. Fill them with your peace so that when stress and anxiety comes, it would not overwhelm them. Fill them with your joy so that the passion they have for their subjects that they teach may become an infectious passion that spreads through all, to all they reach, to their families and their students. We ask this in Christ our name, in the name of Jesus, and the Father, and the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, today's webinar is on joint, uh, history at every age. And Philip Campbell, who's our speaker today, he actually holds a BA in European history from Ave Maria University. He is a licensed secondary educator from Madonna University. He teaches history for homeschool connections, as well as the St. Augustine homeschool program. Uh, he lives up in Ann Arbor. He has served as mayor of this home of his hometown of Howell, Michigan, and you know, from actually from 2011 to 2015. So not only is he an educator, he's a politician. So we'll have him, have him, have him. It'll be great to hear from him. Um, he's also a regular speaker at the homeschool conferences. He's spoken before for us on webinars, and about two months ago, I had a great opportunity to listen to him as a keynote speaker in the Archdiocese of Denver for their History Expo, which was in about a five, front of 500 teachers, history teachers. Um, he's also the author of two of our, our titles, Catholic Textbook Project. He's, he's uh, the Journey Across America, Great Lakes, and Journey Across America, the Great Plains. Both are fourth grade uh, regional books for our series itself. Um, but Phil's going to talk about um, history at every age. He's going to discuss strategies for teaching history to every group, when whether it's elementary, middle, or high school. He will tie the pedag he'll tie history, the pedagogy, and cognitive development together to ensure that. The historical pre presentations are best tailored to target your age group, and um, and then after he has after Philip has a chance to do his presentation, we will take some time to um, uh, take questions. Put your questions in the chat box, please, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. If something is to come up that needs to be ad uh, addressed urgently, I will interrupt Philip and uh, have him address that one. But for the most part, we like to hold all questions to the yeah, end. Yeah, like if, there, if there's and, something um, in my beard, I want to know about it like right away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, but uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Philip. And when Philip's finished, then I will come back and say just a few words about Catholic textbook, both for the homeschool families and for our Catholic schools. So, Philip, I'm going to turn it over to you and I'm going to turn my camera and my sound off. So it's all ready. Yours. All right, thanks, Matt. Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to try to share my screen here and see if this works. So, hang on, just one second. Uh, let's see. Share. 
Okay, whoops. Okay, I'm assuming that we can see this now. <laughs> um, I, I can't see myself, so I hope that uh, that everything's coming through okay. And if it's not, I'm assuming that uh, that Matt will tell me. So thanks again, everybody. I'm really glad to um, to be here today presenting on the subject history at uh, at to be able to present this talk or an abbreviated version of it at a, uh, a conference for the Archdiocese of Denver uh, earlier this year. What you're going to hear is actually an expanded version because I have a little bit more uh, more time here. So we're going to talk about uh, historical education at every age group, like starting from uh, the little kids, you know, like first grade, and then going all the way up to high school. What are the appropriate strategies, um, you know, basic sorts of assignments, reading materials, um, and uh, and basically taking into account what makes the history lesson engaging and then also what we need to be aware of from a cognitive development point of view from our uh, our students. So um, I am taking most of this from my book, The Catholic Educator's Guide to Teaching History. Uh, if you see me looking off of the screen, that's me looking in the book for, for reference. Um, there's going to be, this is available on Amazon. Uh, there's also going to be a direct link sent out an email if you want to uh, purchase it from me directly and cut out the Amazon middleman, <laughs> then you could do that as well. Um, but this this book goes over all this stuff in great detail. And it has all, it, it has, uh, oh gosh, it has, it has like reading lists and it has grading rubrics and it, it tells you everything that I think is important about uh, about teaching history. So if you enjoy this presentation and if you find it helpful, then I hope you'll um, you'll check out the book as well. So um, when we're teaching history, uh, history is a very content heavy subject, right? You have various sorts of uh, various sorts of of subjects, right? You have subjects that are teaching like a practical skill, right? Like think of something like computer programming, where the goal of the class is to teach the students to actually do a skill or something like a physical education class where you're trying to attain a certain uh, level of optimal <laughs> physical performance. Um, uh, of course, you're not really teaching a, any practical skill in, uh, in history class. You're not teaching students to work through formulas, you know, like in math where you're being taught a formula and then you have to sit down and the students have to have to practice to get the formula right or like in in physics. Um, history is simply, uh, you know, at its at its core, it's to educate students about the past to simply impart information. Uh, and so it's a very uh, what I call a content heavy class. It's all about presenting and communicating and mastering content information, and that's fine. Uh, <laughs> I was looking at this this picture here. Uh, I don't know how well I, I just pulled this off the internet. I googled like history lecture. Uh, I, I don't know how I feel about kids having <laughs> their laptops in a lecture like this. The, you can see these two look pretty distracted. They're having a side conversation. I don't know how effective this class is. <laughs> this this picture is doing, but. Um, I'm going to try to teach you how to do a class that's more effective where you're not going to have you know the side conversations and stuff like that going on. But um, but at any rate, this kind of ties into this aspect of history being so content heavy that because it's it's very content heavy, very content rich, um, I think sometimes teachers feel like, OK, all I need to do is stand up there and just, just you know, just deliver the content. You know, it, that's basically what this is. This is just delivering information. So all I got to do is get up there and just you know, just give the information and that's it. But of course, just because history is content heavy does not mean that mere content delivery is the only thing the teacher can focus on. I mean, how many of you, maybe maybe you've heard people say this, maybe you yourself have said this, where you're like, oh gosh, you know, history is really interesting, but you know, every history class I ever had, I didn't like it. You know, it was, it was in high school, it was boring, or I didn't remember anything. It just seemed like a bunch of disjointed information. Um, this is a lot of people's experience with a history class um, because, and usually I think this is the way the content is delivered. I think history is super interesting. Matt thinks it's interesting. We've both devoted our lives, professional lives to promoting its study. You know, so, I mean, the stories of history are great and fascinating and, and wonderful, but, you know, the way it's presented sometimes leaves a lot to be desired. So 
I think in these situations, the teacher's just focusing on just, oh, I just got to deliver the content and, and that's it. Um, but precisely because our, because history is so content heavy, that's why it needs a certain methodology uh, of delivery to make it more digestible to students, right? It's the whole like spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down <laughs> sort of approach, right? Because it's so dense with information, that's why we need to have a real uh, kind of student friendly strategy for delivering this content. The methodology needs to be proportionate, of course, to the student's age uh, in, in terms of what they're learning about and also their cognitive development, like what the student is capable of focusing on, how much information they can realistically retain and what they are going to find easiest to wrap their minds around at any given age. And so what I'm going to deliver in this talk is just the, the Philip Campbell method of handling this. This is just my method. I'm not saying this is, you know, the only method, but this is this is my method. And I've had, you know, a fair degree of success with it over the years. So my method focuses on people, events, ideas, uh, corresponding to different age groups. So when you're in elementary school, historical lectures or lessons will focus on people. As we move into middle school, we're going to focus on events. And then as we move into high school, that's when we discuss ideas. So people, events, and ideas for elementary, middle, and high school. And I actually got this from that, that famous quote of Eleanor Roosevelt, where she said, like, shallow minds talk about people, uh, you know, and then uh, I don't remember the exact quote. <laughs> what does it say here? Let me look at my, my book here. I'm really lost without my notes, guys. I'm really lost. <laughs> uh, oh, she says, small minds discuss people, average minds discuss events, and great minds discuss ideas. And I heard that quote, and I was like, oh, that is really great. Like, that's really how it works with with education, with with history. Small minds, like literal small minds, young minds, talk about people. Developing minds in middle school, we talk about events. And then the developed mind in high school, we talk about ideas. So it's a nice little arc to encapsulate our historical uh, studies. So let's start with elementary school. And in elementary school, in my opinion, what I think you wanna do is build a student's, what I call the historical consciousness, all right? And um, what I mean by historical consciousness is this. When you start with a very young child, like I'm talking about, you know, first grade, you know, somebody who's like, uh, seven years old, six, seven years old, very young children do not have a developed sense of the passage of time, right? There's only, there's only the present and everything is with reference to the present. Like many of you, if you're par your parents, you've probably had this, this experience, right? You're looking at a book or you're, you're seeing something from history. You see a, a picture of Abraham Lincoln, right? And your, your kid says something like, mom, were, were you alive when Abraham Lincoln was around? <laughs> <laughs> makes you feel very young, right? When your kid asks something like that. Or I remember asking my mom, you know, when I was young and I'd see the crucifix on the wall, like, mom, did you know Jesus when you were little? You know, like, you know what I mean? Like, um, kids don't have any developed sense of the passage of time. There's really only the present. And then maybe the stuff before the present was like in their mom's time, <laughs> but they don't have like any, any chronology, any point of reference for how long ago stuff was relative to the present. You know, there's just now, and then there's stuff that happened in the indeterminate past before I was born, right? So um, so kids don't have that developed sense of historical consciousness when they're very young. So in elementary school, we wanna start by kind of forming that out, fleshing out their sense of historical consciousness, um, introducing them to basic time sequencing to different time periods with the present being our point of reference. Like, you know, looking at something like the 1950s or the Civil War, you start to learn like, okay, those things were kind of, a you know, that was like a little while ago. And then something like Columbus, that was longer ago. And then when you get to Knights and Castles, that was 
much longer ago. And then when you get to Egyptians building pyramids, that was much, 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 much longer ago. That's why with young kids doing timelines is so great. With, uh, with my younger children, we used to do timelines where we put the present and then we'd take like, you know, we'd have like a picture of George Washington. We'd put him here and then we'd put Columbus here. And then, you know, Jesus Christ was down here. And, you know, and it, it shows, this, it develops that spatial chronological sequencing. Like, okay, you know, this is how time flows. Certain things were a long time ago. Some things were not very long. And you can put your own family on there too. You know, here's where mom was born, you know, whatever. Here's where your teacher graduated high school. Um, so the present is our point of reference. And we introduce students to basic time sequencing, different time periods, and maybe get them to understand that different time periods look different, you know, like, oh, when we're talking about the Wild West, this is how it looks, you know, I'm talking about the aesthetic of the period. When we're talking about ancient Rome, oh, this is when the people are wearing togas, and when the buildings have these, these columns, and you know, when I see that, I know we're talking about something much longer ago. Or when I see the pyramids, I know we're talking about something way in the past. So just to develop that basic time sequencing. And this sort of stuff develops historical consciousness. And historical consciousness is the framework that will enable a child to think chronologically about events prior to their own life, um, to incorporate people and events into their own mental timeline, and to grasp basic cause and effect. And um, this is extremely important because this is not something that people will develop on their own if just left to their own devices. Like, I'm sure if you're thinking about this, there are plenty of adults who don't have historical consciousness, right? You've probably seen it on, on shows where they go on the street and they ask people questions about history, you know, uh, like who was president during the Vietnam War? And they'll say, uh, Abe Lincoln, you know, or whatever. Like, like people just sometimes their view of history is just a blur. It's just a jumbled mess of things in the past. They have no historical consciousness. And since they don't, they don't know how to incorporate historical events into their own mental timeline of what the world is. And they don't understand historical cause and effect. And then those people go vote. And <laughs> well, you can see the, you know, the, the implications, right? Um, so this is why I think it's very important you know, this is the overarching goal of those early years, build out historical consciousness. So young minds are going to learn about people. A young child's mind is person-centric. You think about it, the most important factors in a child's life are parents, teachers, right? Siblings, people. Young children's mind is person-centric. That's their world revolves around people. And so in history, they respond best to stories about the adventures of interesting men and women. So you want your elementary historical education to focus on, uh, you know, to focus on people, right? How many of us learned about the American frontier by reading Little House on the Prairie, right? We didn't just read a story about, uh, oh, here's frontier life, you know, just in, in abstract. We read about uh, Laura, uh, Laura Ingalls, right? And the Ingalls family. We learn about the frontier through a person-centric approach. So that really goes for the elementary years in general. Elementary curriculum should center on the lives of interesting persons whose lives exemplify the characteristics of the era you are studying. That's why the Little House and the Prairie books are so perennially popular. It's not just that they're good stories. It's that the life of the Ingalls family is uh, an exemplification of the frontier experience. It hits on all the major points of things that frontier people dealt with. Their lives were characteristic of that era. If you're studying uh, George Washington, you know, you're talking about the Revolutionary War, George Washington's life exemplifies the Revolutionary Era. He starts as a loyal uh, young uh, British uh, colonial officer during the French and Indian War, working for the British, right? Then he gets involved in the in the patriot movement he gets involved in the continental congresses and then he leads the the military of the uh of the colonial armies in the revolution and then of course he's president in the constitutional conventions and is the first president so when you look at the birth of our country washington's life hits every beat right so he is a great like anchor person to anchor a study of the revolutionary period around because his life exemplifies all the characteristics of that era and those are the great, uh, the, the great people to build a historical lesson around 
for elementary school. Now, for a pedagogy, uh, you know, how you want to go about this, um, you know, what about how are we going to do this with time periods and dates? Uh, I mentioned earlier, you want to kind of get students interested to that different time periods have different looks, right? Um, when we're studying the Revolutionary War, they're going to see like, okay, there's a certain aesthetic to that period. It's people with triangle hats, <laughs> right? It's people with wigs and triangle hats and uh, the British are wearing the red coats and oh, okay, so I see these pictures and I recognize this as coming from that era, right? And I bet this is true for all of you. I could show you guys a picture of somebody that you didn't even know who they were, right? I could bring up a, a picture and there's some guy in like a, a blue overcoat with the big buttons. He's got the cravat sticking out. He's got the triangle hat. He's holding a musket. And if I say, what period of history is this? You're going to say, that's the revolution, just because you recognize the look, you know? So you already know how to fit that into your, your, uh, your mental paradigm of where that is. So it's good to get students associated with, with the, that sort of um, approach. And that's why like uh, lots of visual stuff, coloring, projects like that that get them into the um you know the aesthetic are really helpful and you also associate these periods with major anchor dates now i don't make young kids memorize a ton of dates by any means maybe a couple here and there but you know your major dates 1492 1776 it's good to get them to remember those and kids like memorizing things you know uh, well, okay well that, maybe that's an exaggeration uh they can have fun memorizing things if you make it fun right they're excited to come back and show what they've memorized um, also, the concept of historical characters, you're, you're introducing history through historical characters. But here's an important point. Uh, they need not be historical. <laughs> There's a paradox for you, right? Your historical characters need not be historical. Another example, Anne of Green Gables, right? Anne of Green Gables is a fictional character. But she, uh, the stories about Anne of Green Gables admirably introduce students to life in Canada uh, on Prince Edward Island at that particular point in, in time, or, you know, going back to the revolution, uh, how many of you read Johnny Tremaine or something like that, right? So it's actually not necessary that the characters you're studying be actual historical persons. They can be historical fiction, right? That's fine. The, pro the point is that they are introducing students through an era, through an interesting character, and teaching students that the past is full of interesting people whose lives have influenced how history unfolded. That's the purpose here. For elementary, um, just some materials and instruction, and I don't have time to go into all of these, but again, you know, get my book and I go through all of these in detail. Age appropriate historical fiction texts, joint reading where you're reading the book together out loud, taking turns, followed by related activities, Audio dramas, kids love audio dramas. Uh, My Story of Civilization books through TAN. The audio dramas are more popular than the texts themselves. <laughs> um, coloring pages are great. I do coloring historical coloring pages with my kids. Making a timeline we mentioned or a project like you see here of a uh, Irish monastery. Doing a poster board project. Making paper dolls. That's a great way to introduce them to, like we said, the aesthetic of the history. And historical recipes, that's fun. <laughs> I had my kids made some hardtack two years ago. You know, the stuff they handed out like soldiers in the Civil War, the, the bread that's hard as a rock. Like, kids, we're going to make some hardtack. They had fun making it, but not so much eating it. <laughs> and then stuff like crossword puzzles, picture matching, word searches to, uh, you know, to build familiarity with these different terms are, are always helpful. All right, let's go to middle school. Now we're going to learn about interrelated events in middle school. So the goal of middle school history is to help students connect the dots by exploring hip important historical events. We started with people, and now we're going to start focusing on the events of history. So middle school education can pose some particular challenges due to uneven cognitive development. Middle schoolers in their best moments are capable of thinking rationally, <laughs> like, you know, like teenagers, like adults. And then in other moments, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're blowing spitwads at you, you know, or they're, they're behaving like children still because they're in that middle stage. Right. Uh, and some of the kids are different. Some of the kids, you know, you get 12 year olds that are very mature and you get others where it's like, they're still kind of in that elementary school, uh, 
mindset. Um, I love middle schoolers, God bless them. But the only two times I took a sabbatical in my professional life was after some particularly uh, challenging years of teaching middle school. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, you have to take account of the kind of like in-betweenness of middle schoolers. Now, one thing cognitively you have to keep in mind is that most children cannot think abstractly until age 12. Now, there's some flexibility to this. You can get kids thinking abstractly at age 10 or 11. For some, it comes as late as age 13. But the average, most children cannot process abstract stuff until age 12. So that means you still want to keep uh, your lessons in middle school fairly concrete, focused on the real nuts and bolts of history, not on like abstract ideas. So you need to walk a delicate balance. Um, you can edge your way into more complex content as they go, as you get up to like eighth grade, but keeping it simple enough for students whose comprehension is still developing, who are still building their reading skills, who are still building their writing skills. This is where the greatest uh, diversity is in middle school is in writing skills. Like I will teach middle school and I get some kids who just, you see their handwriting, their way of explaining things. They are, they're excellent writers. And then you see others where you can tell they're still learning handwriting and they're still learning how to express themselves on, on paper. So you gotta, you, you know, you gotta have a, a pedagogy, a, a, a assignments that can encompass that whole spectrum, right? So middle school minds learn events. Now, events are great for this, this in-between uh, stage, because events are more complicated than just learning people. You're, you're getting to more complexity, more cause and effect, but they're also very concrete. You're keeping it grounded in the real without veering too much into abstractions. So in elementary school, we've kind of built out the historical consciousness, and now we're going to populate it with all sorts of fun events to learn about, kind of fill that historical consciousness in. Uh, and again, keeping it grounded in the real without veering too much into abstractions. So in middle school, this is a good time to center lessons around a historical era. Like this month we're doing Roman Empire. This month we're doing Middle Ages, right? You you can center everything around a, uh, a an era. And if you're doing whole unit studies, you know, you can center other subjects around it too, like your history is on the Middle Ages, your literature is on the Middle Ages, your arts and crafts are on the Middle Ages, so that the student's mind is getting full immersion treatment of the Middle Ages or whatever era you're doing. So it's good in middle school to center your lessons around an entire era, I think. It's just, it's more uh, immersive that way. And if you can, to tie in like your literature and your art and, and stuff like that. Now, uh, I'm not saying, of course, that you, uh, you know, in elementary school, we're talking about person-centric characters. You're not going to abandon characters as you get into, you know, middle school. You're going to, so these, these uh, strategies are all cumulative, right? You start with characters, and now you're doing events, but you're still keeping characters in there. You're still building your narrative, your story around historical characters, um, but now you are much more interested in showing the interconnectedness of historical events. You're more interested in showing like, okay, uh, the French uh, had been conquered by the English and therefore, um, you know, Joan of Arc came along uh, inspired by God to, uh, you know, to take up the cause of French independence. And therefore the king, you know, entrusted an army to her. And, and, and as a result of that, she, you know, she, she won these battles. And then as a result of that, the, the prince was crowned, and then as a result of that, you know, and so you're you're going through these events, and you're building out this this cause and effect, and showing the interconnectedness of all those historical events, and how the people and events kind of uh, interplay to build that flow of history. So, um, the pedagogical principle here in middle school history is the interconnectedness of historical events through cause and effect. And what I just gave an example of with talking about Joan of Arc, this is like demonstrating how one thing leads to another, moving history from one epoch to the next. So the goal here is to create like a basic overview of a how and why a certain period unfolded as it did with general knowledge of the people and events. So 
going back to George Washington, I said, like, for elementary school, you might say, like, okay, kiddies, we're going to study the life of George Washington. You know, here's all the stuff Washington did. You know, we're going to learn about George Washington. We're going to make our, we're going to make our Betsy Ross flag craft. We're going to do, you know, color the Revolutionary War soldier, you know, do the maze, you know. <laughs> can you get, can you get George Washington from here to, uh, uh, to Yorktown, you know, <laughs> we're doing just doing that stuff. You know, life of George Washington. But now when we get to middle school, now it's going to be like, let's talk. You know, how why did this all play out the way it did? Let's talk about the uh, the taxes. Let's talk about the Boston Tea Party. Let's talk about um, the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Right? Let's talk about Valley Forge. We're talking about these events that are like. Uh, connecting the dots, right, to move things along. This is the crux of a fully developed historical consciousness. Um, have you guys ever looked at, uh, have you ever looked at the stars and looked at the constellations and been like, how on earth did ancient people ever think that looked like a horse? <laughs> you know, you're like, looks like a blob. How did ancient people think that was a horse? And then you look at the chart where it's drawn on there, you know, where they where they, they connect the dots. And then you're like, okay, I, I can see that's kind of a horse. Um, but without those lines, you're like lost when you're looking at that constellation, <laughs> right? Unless it's something easy like the Southern Cross, I don't know. But you're lost, you know, and it's the same way with history. If you don't have the lines connecting the dots of the events, like history is just an undifferentiated mass of things that you're just looking at, just like people looking at the stars in the sky and being like, okay, I, I don't see the constellations, you know? So you need these events to connect the dots, to move the flow of history. And then just like when you see that star chart, you're like, ah, okay, I, I get it, right? So this is the crux of a fully developed historical consciousness. Now, um, for materials and instruction, age-appropriate textbooks, and and historical fiction. For elementary, I just said a, I just said age-appropriate historical fiction. I usually didn't give tech when I was teaching. I didn't give textbooks to elementary kids. Now I know that's hypocritical because I write textbooks for elementary kids <laughs> for for Tan, <laughs> and I love them. They're great books. You should all purchase them. Um, but I think I guess what I'm saying is I don't think a textbook is a strict necessity for elementary school. It's great if you have a good textbook. Um, Catholic Textbook Project, who is graciously hosting this webinar, they have great uh, materials for elementary age. TAN has great materials for elementary age. Um, but if you don't find a book um, that jives with elementary, with your students' you know, level of development, don't worry about it. You can just stick with historical fiction, it's fine. But by the time you get to middle school, this is where I think you definitely want to have the textbook. And that's why there's like just a proliferation of middle school textbooks, because this is the age when students can start to derive a lot of benefit from an age appropriate textbook coupled with historical fiction. I think also at this age, um, they are able to start, um, you know, having more of a traditional format, a lecture with notes. And in, in my book, I recommend that maybe, uh, you know, you know, if you're a teacher in a classroom, that you know, you don't do this every single day, maybe a lecture, you know, if you have, you have your students five days a week, maybe three days a week with notes, you know, take having notes no more than 20 to or 30 to 40 minutes. And then the other days you're doing activity or review. They're old enough to start being accountable for what they're learning with, with age appropriate quizzes and tests. And I talk about in the book, what constitutes an age appropriate quiz or test. Book reports are great for middle school. We, I, I remember doing my first book report in middle school in history on Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> I still remember that. Poster presentations like you see here. Uh, I love these. I always assign these in middle school uh, twice a year. Poster presentations, doing the research, finding the pictures, giving a presentation on what you learned. This is, uh, this is a time-tested and uh, fun activity. Review games are great too. Uh, history review games. You know, let's play History Jeopardy, right? That's a good review game. Okay, explain why questions. Uh, I got a question from a, uh, a teacher not long ago about like, you know, at what age in middle school do you start introducing more, you know, kind of like those analytical questions where it's not just 
give me the right term or define something, but kind of like explain why. Um, you're just going to have to feel out where your students are, where your children are. But I start easing these in in seventh grade. And then by eighth grade, it's like a staple of my history assignments is, is stuff that are asking the students to explain why, to explain the cause and effect, right? Uh, so you slowly want to build up to that as you go. Okay, now by the time we get to high school, now we are doing the great ideas. <laughs> We're talking about ideas because by high school, students are capable of thinking matured in their cognitive development to the point where you can introduce uh, abstract uh, abstract thinking, right? Um, and gosh, this, this picture here of this history guy giving his lecture on his podium with his map and his notes, this is my, this guy's my spirit animal right here. Uh, when I first gave history, I had a podium just like that. I miss it. This, this podium makes me nostalgic. That's how you know you're a lifelong teacher, right, Matt? You see a podium and you're like, that makes me nostalgic. With some people, it's a car. With some people, it's a song. With educators, it's a vintage podium. <laughs> they don't make podiums anymore like they did in the old days. <laughs> Now they're now they're big like plastic monstrosities with like carpet on them, and they have like all these plugs and stuff to plug in things. Just give me that good old, give me that good old timey wooden podium. Uh, sorry guys, it's a little early. I'm in one of my moods. <laughs> all right. Um, so by high school, students are capable of thinking abstractly. And so high school is the time to introduce students to those driving ideas behind history, right? Because of course, you know, what drives history, right? We talk about like, okay, George Washington, then the Boston Tea Party, but why? Like why the Boston Tea Party? Why, like what's the ideas that are driving these things? You know, history doesn't just unfold in a vacuum. There's ideas that are moving it along. And in high school, students are capable of thinking about those ideas. So um, this means that by the time you get to age 13, 14, 15, your high schoolers are prepared to tackle some of the more conceptual aspects of history, uh, the abstract ideas, the grand ideals that have shaped the world. So let's look at it this way. Elementary school, who? Middle school, what? High school, why? Okay, who, what, why? That's your progression. That's your ascent through the world of historical study from little kids up to high schoolers. Who, what, why? You're ready to have, you know, in-depth discussions with high schoolers about these, these great uh, ideas. And by great, I don't necessarily mean the great ideas like that they're all good ideas. <laughs> I mean the great ideas and like the ones that have had a great impact on the way the world developed. So, you know, communism is one of those great ideas because it's been very uh, influential or impactful, had many consequences. So, you know, kind of like the good and the bad are all encompassed in the, the great. Maybe I should change that. Maybe not call them the great ideas. The pivotal ideas is what I mean here. So high school minds are going to learn about ideas, right? Um, here's a famous picture. Uh, I think it's called American Progress. Matt can correct me in the in the uh, chat if I'm wrong, but I think it's called like American Progress or the Progress of America or something like that. This depicts the spirit of the westward movement to settle the frontier in the decades after the Civil War. And this is a highly symbolic uh, painting. You can see this woman here uh, symbolizes the spirit of progress. And you can see that from that the east coast of the country is well lit. See the sun rising? This is the sun of civilization. And you can see the signs of civilization, cities, bridges, ships, trains. But she's bringing civilization west. And you can see the west over the mountains, it's dark. This is the, this is the, the, uh, the frontier where things are wild and uncivilized. They have the darkness of barbarism. And she's bringing the light of civilization, connecting the west to the east by the telegraph line. See the telegraph line she's holding in her hand and the train following along and all the settlers uh, coming in her wake to the West. And you can see the Native Americans are being driven before them, right? The Native Americans and the Buffalo are yielding before 
the uh, the march of progress, which is portrayed here as kind of inevitable, right? So there's a lot of ideology in this picture, right? If if I were to look at this picture, you know, you have to understand the ideology of the time to get this picture. Otherwise, it's like okay, like there's weird angel lady like dragging a cord over the prairie. <laughs> like what what is that? You know, you have to understand the ideology of you know manifest destiny. Uh, the the American view of the uh, the uh, uh, of what constituted civilization, the equivalence of civilization with Europeanization, uh, the nineteenth century view of Native Americans and their place and all that. There's all these ideas you have to understand to make sense of this picture, and that's how history is in general. To make sense of history, you have to understand the ideas. So, and this is great for teenagers because teenagers are already focused on questions of self-identity. This is when a teenager is beginning to formulate their own sense of identity, their own ideological opinions about the world. They are basically looking for meaning. They're starting to, to start to think about these big ideas. And so this is the perfect time to introduce them to the historical ideas because they're in a stage of cognitive development that resonates with that. So lessons that explore historical ideologies are great. Um, how different epics handled questions of identity and meaning are particularly suited. Looking at different religious, you know, from a Catholic perspective, um, uh, looking at how the Catholic faith influenced the, the development of history or doing comparative religious studies like, okay, we know Catholicism teaches this. How is this actually different from like what Islam teaches? Because you all know in the world, there's this idea of like, well, all religions are basically the same, you know, they, they basically all teach the same thing. But those of us who are educated know that is absolutely not true. Like, like G.K. Chesterton said it best. He said, no, no, no. Uh, it's not that all religions are basically the same and they look different. All religions look the same, but they have different ideas. All religions have candles and vestments and holy places and holy books and pilgrimages, all that stuff. The exterior might look the same, but the ideas are very, very different. So this is a great time to like explore those sorts of uh, discussions, right? And it's also an opportunity to get your students to think critically about ideas, to practice comparative analysis of the merits of historical ideas, not just to um, not just to uncritically, you know, gobble down whatever idea is being put forward, but to say, okay, let's uh, you know, let's give a critique of that idea. Let's um, let's kind of deconstruct it a bit and see what its merits are. How does it stand up to scrutiny? This is a great time for that as well. So the conceptual framework of history, um, you're spending much more time exploring the, the concepts, the conceptual framework behind the events of history, learning about why things happened and the ideologies behind it. So for example, like you might see a picture, like I was saying earlier, I could show you a picture, you'll know what historical time period it is. Let's say I show you a picture of a mob of people, uh, putting a guy in a guillotine and they're about to like pull the rope and slice his head off. What period of history is that? Okay. If you said French Revolution, you're correct. Now, why did they do that? <laughs> Mommy, why are they cutting the man's head off? See what I mean? you're building up the conceptual framework. Why did this happen, right? What was the ideology that made people think they needed to do that? So this is the time to talk about the isms of history and explore the real world effects, the real world consequences of different systems of thought, right? The real world consequences. They say that, you know, one reason that that people like in college, college age students in secular universities are so enamored with communism is because they don't understand the real world consequences of what communism actually does, right? So this is a good time to explore those isms and the real world effects that ideas have. I mean, I'm an idealist when it comes to history, meaning that I believe that ideas are the driving force behind you know, historical development. So. People have different opinions on that, but that's my perspective. And so I'm going to think like, yeah, you really want to get kids acquainted with ideas and how they affect the movement of history. 
But also in, in line with this is analytical reading is something you want to introduce into your pedagogy. Not just learning to read what an author is saying, but to think critically about the text and offer interpretive analysis. So in my American history class for years now, I've given, when we talk about the Gilded Age, you know, the robber barons, the age of, uh, you know, the age of Andrew Carnegie and Rockefeller, such a, a fun time to study. Um, I've given them a reading uh, from, uh, from a, a strike. Um, oh gosh, I'm drawing a blank on which strike it is. Uh, one of the strikes that turned into a battle. I can't remember. <laughs> Guys, I can only fit so much historical information in my head at any one time. Trust me. It, it just pushes other things out. So I give them a reading that's like a, a newspaper article written in like 1881 or something um, or 1890s about some strike. And um, I have them read the article and I have them, you know, offer a critical analysis of kind of like what side the article is taking, you know, and you read through the article and, you know, there's the strikers and then there's the, the, the company men, you know, and the article calls the, the, the leaders of the strike, it calls them men of brave soul. It calls them heroes, you know, and then the, the company men, it calls them rats, assassins, you know, and it's fairly straightforward, you know, but I have them read and I'm like, what side do you think the author is on? And get them to think about like, okay, I'm not just going to take just whatever I'm given, you know, and just, just swallow it entirely. I'm going to think critically about the text itself and offer an interpretive analysis, right? This is the time for that, to, t to, to teach that kind of analytical, critical reading of uh, historical texts. So um, when you're in high school, you want a solid core textbook, you know, something that's very informative. Um, Catholic Textbook Project has great high school level textbooks, uh, solid, full of information, pulls together all the cause and the effect and the, the ideas and the isms, good stuff. Um, lecture coupled with independent reading. Analytical evaluation of text, what I was just mentioning, you're going to you know, say like, let's, uh, let's not just read, but let's uh, try to read between the lines, you know, see what this author is really getting at here. Oral presentations, I think are great for, uh, for high school, learning to speak competently about historical subjects. Research papers, <laughs> the students, okay, the students are going to loathe it now. Okay, they're going to loathe it later too. <laughs> when they get to, I was going to say they'll love it when they get to college. They won't love it, but they'll at least be thankful that they have the, the foundation of learning how to do a research paper when they get to college and they're mandatory, right? Primary sources. Oh my gosh, I'm so big on primary sources getting students to read documents that were actually written by the people involved at the time. Uh, I personally have several primary source collections. I have a, I have a middle age primary source collection, uh, a, a Reformation era primary source collection. I just released a new one on the early church fathers. Um, you, can find, uh, you can find them on my website. I'll, I'll give it out at the end, but I have lots of um, uh, primary source texts with answer keys, you know, and assignments to give your students writing prompts. So I think this is important to actually read real history because remember before the modern period, that's what studying history was, was actually reading the historical texts. Taking historical trips. Now, of course, you can take a historical trip with any age, but I think it's when they're in high school that a student really appreciates the historical trip most because they have um, you know, more of an idea about the place they're going, like going to a battlefield, you know, going to a historical site. Historical reenactment projects. I remember when I was in seventh grade, my dad and I built a crossbow, like built a medieval crossbow. That was so cool. Or, you know, uh, doing like a, you know, built, you know, doing the costume or doing something like that. That can be great. Okay. So I just gave you a ton of information and, you know, I'm sorry, my mind's going like a million miles a minute because this is great stuff. This is my life. This is what I live and breathe 24 hours a day. Uh, and so there's so much more. Um, by focusing your studies, though, successively on people, events, and ideas, you can create a historical curriculum that ascends to those higher levels of historical awareness over time. And that is, you know, and that your your content delivery, your your expectations of work, what you're delivering to the students it is age appropriate for their level of, uh, of cognitive development. 
So again, I want to recommend my book, The Catholic Educator's Guide to Teaching History. Um, you can get it on Amazon and you can also get it um, uh, through my uh, website down here. Um, you can go on philipcampbell.net uh, or you can go on, uh, I have, um, I have a, um, I have a, uh, a website, crewkinhill.com, where I sell a lot of my, my books. You can also find them on TAN, Avamir Press, ARCS. Um, if you're on Facebook, feel free to follow me at uh, Philip Campbell, author, teacher. And if you're interested in having your students, if you're a homeschooler or you just want to get some supplemental history, I teach through Homeschool Connect connections dot uh, com. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Matt. I don't know how to stop my screen share. I guess I'll press escape and see what happens. Uh, All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, great information. I love your enthusiasm and your compassion for what you do, especially uh, in the area of history, because that's also what we do as a company. Um, there were a few questions that came up. I'll just read them to you. If you maybe you can see them now. Uh, one of them is about dyslexia. Um, looks like primarily for high school students uh, from Diana. Is there anything how you want maybe address that? Yeah, um, I, I actually talk about this in the book. Um, when you get a student who has uh, dyslexia or for whatever reason isn't uh, you know able to read um, uh, with ease, and, and that's where I would I would switch over and default to much more orally focused. Uh, I, I found that dyslexic students are really great at you know, when you give them a lecture or something, you know, uh, deliver it orally, they're really good at remembering it. They're really good at, uh, you know, and, and giving it back to you. So that's when I would say lean more heavily into oral presentation, into stuff that's pictorial, you know, into stuff like uh, like video, like educational videos for, for projects. Instead of saying you're going to write a paper, you know, it's like, okay, you're going to, uh, you know, you're going to tell me or give a talk or give a demonstration or something that just leans more heavily into those other uh, you know, those other demonstrations of learning that aren't writing and, and reading. And meanwhile, of course, still working on the dyslexia on, on the side. But, you know, you're going to lean more heavily into those other um, uh, other types of education. Right. And one of the things we've done at Catholic Textbook Projects, we've gotten questions about this from all sorts of families and schools about dyslexia or autism. We've now put all our books as audio books. So when they purchase the uh, the ebook or the internet book, uh, they're able to have the audio to read along with yeah. uh, for the students and to I, see, see the words and also and listen. And I want to say there's a real, um, there's a real, um, I'm going to call it a bias in modern society that, that books equals like smart or like the real way of learning is by reading, you know, like, like, like this is the real way to get it is from a book. And if you have a problem, then you get it somewhere else, you know, but I mean, that's totally wrong because we learn so many ways. And, and, and Matt, you know, throughout yeah. most of history, like if you went to college in the Middle Ages, you were just hearing an oral presentation. If, if you sat at Socrates' feet, you know, Socrates wasn't handing you a book, you know, he was he was just speaking, yeah. you know. And so the great the great teachers, the ones that people called master, you know, those were the ones that were masters of oral content delivery. And that's I mean, that's just as much education, you know, as reading from a book. So. Right. Great. Uh, another question was about uh, how do we respond to inaccuracies in books and obviously biases or, or biases? Yeah. Inaccuracies obvious. or obvious bias. Um, well, obviously, if you know that, I mean, sometimes there's going to be inaccuracies. Like, I, I mean, my books for TAN, like I, I proofread them three or four times. We had a doctor of history proofread them. And then even af after that, you know, you publish it and then within a week, some homeschool moms emailing me like, you said that this happened in this year, but it was wrong, you know, and it's like, oh, gosh. So it's one thing to say there's an inaccuracy. You know, that happens to even the best of us. But a bias is something different. Um, obviously, if you find that the text is very biased, you just want to avoid it if you can. Um, sometimes, though, you know, uh, you can use the bias as a uh, it depends on your student's level of critical thinking. OK, you don't want to give your kids right. poison, you know. But sometimes if they're advanced enough, like, and I know there's a source that's biased, like I'll let the kid read it and I'll, and we'll turn it into a lesson in recognizing the bias, you know, because exactly. the way you, the, the way you inoculate your kids against bias is not to have them avoid all bias, 
because then when they actually get exposed to it later in the world, they're not going to recognize that it's a biased source because they've never read biased sources. So like I was saying, in my history class, I intentionally give them biased sources sometimes, and I tell them it's biased, and I ask them to identify what makes it biased so that they start to identify, okay, this guy's pushing an angle here, you know? So there's a place for that. But obviously, if it's biased to the degree that it's it loses its value, that it's just undermining what you're doing, you you, you know, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to use that if possible. And there's a exactly. and there's a whole chapter in here. I think uh, I think in this book I have a whole chapter on bias. Yeah, chapter six, the problem of historical bias. So I address this in a, in a whole chapter by itself. Yeah, and we're very concerned that Catholic textbook project is the same thing. And we, you know, we do, like Philip said, sometimes mistakes are made, inaccuracies happen, not on purpose. We have fact checkers, we have historians, both in the secular world and the Catholic historians, you know, checking our books to make sure they're accurate. But sometimes you do miss a date, or you might miss something, or it maybe didn't wasn't explained as well as it could have been. And we thank people for bringing those to our attention. So we'll rewrite it in the next printing. It'll be changed. So we're not against, you know, changing if we think that it could be it's something that it warrants it. Um, so but the things that when it comes to the biases and stuff, you know, for us, we don't have political agendas that, you know, people when we go write our books, we don't have um, activist groups writing our books. And these are what some of our secular books are doing today. And it's kind of scary if you see what they're putting out there. I mean, there's a company out there that accuses the Catholic Church of their black magic and performing black magic. And basically what they're referring to are sacraments. You know, we know our sacraments are not magic. They're not magical, they are gifts from God. And we have to recognize that. So those are the kinds of things that you have to be um, really aware of, uh, especially the different biases that are out there. But like Philip just said, it's okay, maybe you can turn a bias into a learning experience or a learning situation for your classroom or your students. Yeah, and I even do it at a, a, a like, you can even do it younger, like with um, like with elementary or middle school students. Like I'll I'll show them a picture, of um, show them a picture of, of Pharaoh Ramses the second at the Battle of Kadesh, and in this picture, like all the people he's fighting are this big, you know. But Ramses is this big, you know. He's he like dominates the scene, and it's it's a uh, it's easy to put it. Say like, okay, what does the king want people to think about him? You know, what is the purpose of this picture? Uh, how does the king view himself versus enemies? You know. And get them to recognize, okay, this is like a propaganda piece, you know, trying to make make Ramesses look uh, as big and imposing as he possibly can. Um, but I wanted to um, I wanted to address. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, yes. you were like you were yeah, getting we a little know, pixelated. I wasn't sure. Um, I wanted to address yeah. Valerie's uh, question. She says, "I'm all for writing book reports and research papers. I don't feel qualified to grade them." Um, well. I mean, if you're not qualified to grade them, ultimately you got to find somebody who who is. Um, I personally, at Homeschool Connections, I offer a grading service where you can pay me a fee, and I'll grade your students, you know, papers. I'm a glutton for punishment. What can I say? You know, as long as I know what the parameters are, I can grade them. Uh, if you want to talk to me about that, you can send me an email. But you know, if you're part of a co-op or something like that, where there is a history teacher or somebody that you can draw on in your homeschooling community, that's a uh, that's a good thing to do. As far as what subject for poster presentations, I just let the child pick. Um, I will say, like, if we're doing Revolutionary War, I'll say it could be any person, any event, you know, any idea. Uh, it just has to be related to the Revolutionary War, and go, and then let the student do it. Right. That's that's the same thing we do with our essay contest that we held every year. We give parameters for each of the different age level, grade levels, and then we uh, let the students write the essays and they turn them in. And this year we had a record number of essays come in. So and they're being judged right now. So for those who have submitted them, let you know that we hope to have by the middle of the end of May the announce the winners of our essay contest. Oh, cool. Um, so yeah, and the other um, we saw you some of the uses is. Our Catholic textbook projects. We thank you for that. They also use uh, Phillips books uh, from TAN, which is uh, you know we work with them closely. Uh, otherwise, you know, here we have Philip writing for both companies. We're not really in competition because TAN really is lower grade levels, and and we're uh, we're grades more grades four through twelve. Um, but we uh, and so we're excited at Catholic textbook project for what we have to offer and what TAN has to offer. And the key is is that we provide quality 
uh, Catholic materials for our students, whether they're in a homeschool setting or in a Catholic school setting, because there's not a lot out there anymore. And uh, it's scary what's being taught in our secular world today. You know, as, as uh, Philip is written for us, our books are written in a narrative format. Uh, we tell the story of history, what en engages, we encourage, we work with, you know, the memorization of the dates, places, and events. But what's more important is that our students understand what those date, places, and events mean. And by, you know, telling it in a narrative format, storytelling, engaging the different ideas, things that Philip shared today in his presentation for the different levels will help students do this, will help them to really learn to appreciate and to love history. It's funny, when I was growing up, history was boring to me, as Philip was mentioning. I felt our, my history class in high school was right after lunch. You know what happens after you eat a heavy meal and you're out playing and you go into the classroom. Our instructor, he always put the film strip on or some type of movie and the lights go out and we all went to sleep. So that was my history. It's funny because my dad was a historian. My dad was a history teacher. Uh, he loved history and as my mom does too. So uh, I wanted, I wanted to address Lisa's up. question. She said, how did you choose the vignettes in your story of civilization? Uh, that's a great question. And um I basically, sometimes I just made them up, uh, like based on what I, I don't know. I, I just made them up on the fly as I was going, some of them. Some of them were taken from real life, um, like historical readings, you know, like for example, in, um, in, uh, in volume three on European history, there's a story on the British in India where a, an Indian mob attacks a British family. That's an actual primary source reading that I give in my high school class. So I based it off that. Uh, but most of the time, it was just me just, you know, reading about the history and just making something up on the fly. <laughs> they seem to have held up pretty good, though. Right. And, and somebody mentioned about where do we send typos or things, that you, you know, corrections, especially for Catholic textbook. And we had made mistakes and we'll be the first ones to admit it. You can send them to me. And or you, you basically, you know, you go on to the website and there's a thing that you can uh, submit um whether not you have to ask smith for sample but you put comments in but mostly if it's just email to me i make sure they get to christopher zender who's our author and general editor and he's always open to you know getting the errors because you know we're human even though we have also types of people uh reading our books evaluating our books editing our books proofing our books mistakes are still made because you know how many words are in a book there's a lot of words in a book and uh you know whether uh, we transpose a date, which we've done, or misspelled a word, or, um, you know, different things. If it comes to something factual that you don't agree with, we all want to hear about that, too, because we will do some more research into that and to make sure that then if it's we feel it's correct, we'll give you our explanation of it. Um, and so, and if it is, if you, and if we find out maybe we could have rewarded it or word it differently, we will in the next printing. Uh, but we appreciate any input, feedback, whether, you know, it's typos, grammatical, or even uh, historical facts, things like that. We want to know about it because we want to make sure we pride ourselves in uh, factual books. We pride ourselves in telling the truth about history where our secular textbooks do not. They, have no, they, they, don't, they don't know what the word truth means when it comes to telling the, telling the story of history. They just try to glamorize it. They try to Hollywoodize it uh, in a variety of different things. So. Well, all, all right. right. If, there's, um, uh, if there's anything else, feel free to contact me through my Facebook page, Philip Campbell, author, teacher, or I'm actually going right. to, uh, I'm actually going to just be bold and toss out my email here. Now, uh, this is the, this is the email that my contact form goes to on my website anyways. So, um, and again, please check out my books and uh, I hope you'll get a hold of this book if you're interested in teaching uh, history, learning more about this. And uh, thanks again, Matt. It was a, a pleasure. Yeah. Well, thank you, Philip. And everybody is still on. We will send you the recording of this, and all those who are registered will get the recording. And it also have a live link straight to uh, Philip's book to order it. So that'll be coming out in the next couple of days, probably most likely on Monday. But uh, we want to thank everybody um, for being a part. Um, our books are, we have grades, grades 4 through 12. Our newest title is uh, The New American Venture. It's an eighth grade American history book. It's just out, and it'll be ready in the warehouse by the first part of August. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I want everybody to have a great weekend and have continue to have a blessed Easter season. Thank you. God bless Bye. everybody.